In today's video, I share with you a preview of an upcoming Kickstarter called Tradefell. But before we get into today's video, just want to share with you what the GGGGs are for this month. Each month, Bob the Beholder picks some of my Patreon supporters to receive gratitude gifts. And for this month of April of 2023, we have this $50 credit towards Terrainify, where they provide STL files, they can print the terrain for you, or they can print and paint and flock the terrain. Two $25 credits for LV427, also a discount code for all of my viewers that you can use to get 20% off of your first order from their website. They create really unique sci-fi rooms for printing. We also have this game from Starfinder, Pirates of Skydock. And then finally, we have $100 going towards a crowdfunder, which is currently being voted upon by my Patreon supporters. It's either going to be the game Terrascape or STL Files from Kingdom of Durak Deep. Bob the Beholder is going to be making his picks this upcoming Sunday. So go ahead and use the link below to go to my Patreon page to get in on that. So Trent, the creator of Tradefell, reached out to me and I agreed to make a preview video. He did send me this initial Roberts Tower STL file and I printed and painted it. And this is actually going to be one of the GGGGs for next month, May of 2023. But I really like his models a lot and put on uh, my signature blue roofs that I have used for a lot of my other fantasy type buildings. One of the things that I really like about the buildings that he is coming out with with the upcoming Kickstarter is that all of his buildings are pretty unique, just like this tower that has this bump out here, as well as this section down here. It's just not a boring sort of straight tower, but instead just has a really unique style to it that I like a lot. We are going to go over to the website and I'll show you a preview page of the campaign that's going to be coming up and some of the buildings that are going to be provided. But just looking at this tower by itself, you can see that it has a lot of fun characteristics and is uh, relatively unique in the space of having fantasy terrain. I know there's a ton of options that are out there and I've printed out a lot of fantasy buildings myself, but I do think that this set is uh, has some really nice and unique products to them. Now, because of the way that these files are created, I did have to... Uh, put on supports and here I'm going to put on the screen the settings that I use for my Prusa slicer because the stock settings make it almost impossible to remove without damaging the piece. So these are the settings that I found online that will enable easy removal of these supports and I did actually use uh, supports everywhere with most of the pieces. In fact, when I tried to print this lower piece, this lower piece was the only one that I didn't use supports for. Um, this uh, front part, porch part, sort of did fail a little bit and warped outwards because I didn't put any supports down here. So you got to be careful with that. You have to check out where you do have overhangs. And uh, with these, you do need to provide some supports and you do spend some time removing those after these prints are made. But I think it's worth it because you do have a lot of depth to these pieces. They're not very shallow and you have a lot of unique angles as you can see here. The other thing to note is that the interior spaces aren't really playable because there isn't a floor and, and even in this piece it isn't even split at the floor level but sort of midway so that it fits your build plate. Um, here on the base level, this is playable where you can have miniatures in here. But overall, I would say at least with this tower piece, uh, you're going to be primarily using the externals, which is anyway what I use because for most of my games, I am actually um, not putting miniatures on the inside, but instead they function as obstacles, usually in my wargaming. But this set would be a nice sort of town set to have on your board if you're playing D&D &D or other war games, fantasy war games like I play. I do have a painting tutorial at the end of the video as well, so go ahead and use the timestamp below if you want to skip to see how I painted this. But I use the same technique that I have shown in previous tutorials, so there isn't any new technique that I show here. Let's go ahead and move on over to the computer where I can walk you through a preview page. And a quick note 
Um, all of the files that I received uh, might be changed as they aren't final versions. These are just the ones that I received uh, to be able to print out for this review video. So here's the preview Kickstarter page. Again, this is likely gonna change by the time this launches on the 1st of May, but you can at least get an idea of what is going on and it is going to last for the uh, entire month, but you can sign up to be reminded of once the project goes live. And here is an early bird pledge that's gonna be $20, so make sure that you pledge at the very beginning. There's only uh, gonna be 20 of those. So if you're able to jump on that as soon as it goes live, you are able to um, pledge for $20. And then you're also going to get this dice hammer, which looks really cool. You can store dice inside of it, which is neat. Uh, and then the standard pledge is gonna be $30 uh, after that. And uh, you have the commercial pledge at 75. But let's take a look at these buildings. You have this basic cottage which um, I'm thinking of printing out and using for Oathsworn. And then everything else is pretty unique with different kinds of bump outs and uh, features on it. So I don't really see buildings that are this varied. So it looks really cool. Um, here is the two story, which is a little bit more basic. And then check this out. I think the Noble's Manor here is again, has a lot of cool features that are incorporated into it. And all of these do have video so that you can see a 360 degrees. Here's the Roberts Tower, which is what I printed out. And uh, in his render, at least, he has uh, one of the roofs painted purple. So you, uh, it shows you what it looks like with different colored roofs. And then here is the tavern, which looks pretty cool as well. And then what I really like is this incorporation of a fortress uh, with the walls. And I really like how he put in wood as part of the feature too. And I'm really gonna see whether or not these walls are gonna be usable for Zombicide White Death, which uh, I think should be wrapping up or over by the time my video posts. But gonna see if these sort of modular ramparts are gonna work with that game. I sort of need a four by four. So I might be reaching out to Trent to see whether or not he would be able to make a four by four pieces of wall that I could use for that game. But I think how he incorporates in building with the um, wall itself looks really cool and is integrated and matches really well because you do have that wood. It isn't just entirely stone. So that's super cool too. So we'll see if um, there's gonna be any stretch goals involved with this. Here are some catapults, ballista, so uh, siege weapons that you can put. And he does suggest that you do print these out on resin. And then he has a bunch of miniatures that you can incorporate in which is super cool too. Now, I'm, I'm not gonna be printing out, I rarely print out miniatures because I, I already have a huge backlog of miniatures that I need to paint up, but it looks like he also has some geometric trees too, which is pretty unique as well. And then he has some um, market stall features too that you can use. Uh, so super cool. Um, again, this is gonna be his first Kickstarter, so I'm unsure as to whether or not there's going to be a lot of stretch goals or whatnot. I think his goal is 2,500, which I'm fairly confident he's gonna be able to reach that because I think these pieces are uh, different enough from all the other ones that are currently available that I think he's gonna do well. So go ahead and use the link below to go to the preview page if it's before May 1st. And then hopefully, I think that link will also work for the uh, Kickstarter page once it goes live. If not, I will update the link, but this should give you a good idea of what's gonna be in the campaign. So there you have it. Go ahead and click on the link below to go to the preview page and sign up to be notified once it does go public, which will be May 1st, and you can jump on. There is an early bird where you can receive the hammer, the dice hammer, which I think is super cool. But go ahead and support these small independent artists like Trent. Uh, by supporting him through this Kickstarter. And again, this piece will be one of the GGGGs for next month. Happy printing, happy painting. We'll see you next time. All right, the first step is to spray paint and spray prime everything. 
And what I use is this ultra flat Krylon camouflage brown. It's the darkest brown that I can find that is relatively matte. So this is one of my most favorite um, primers. The reason why you need to prime is so that the acrylic paint will stick to the model better. And this is going to be a great um, color to be able to paint up sort of warm colors onto this building. So I do have a fourth piece that's drying outside right now. So now we're grabbing the milk chocolate from Americana. You can buy this at Hobby Lobby or at Michael's. For those of you who don't have access to Americana, you can just get sort of a medium brown. And then I am using a hog's hair brush, which is relatively cheap. You can buy these in uh, packs of like 20 or so, uh, or a dozen, and uh, they're relatively cheap. The reason why I use a hog's hair brush is because, see how it doesn't put the paint down into the cracks and crevices because you want the lines from the grain to be able to show through the sort of the dark brown that's part of the undercoating. And see how I'm sort of going against the grain so that it doesn't fill up the lines too much. So you want, you want to do this with all of the wood and on, on these models there are a lot of wooden beams and I appreciate that the grain of the wood is pretty deep, which makes it easier to maintain that dark brown undercoating. So go ahead and do this to all of the pieces. And what I find, because this dark brown is so dark, that um, just one coat of this milk chocolate isn't typically enough, and I have to do two once this dries, once this first coat dries. So let me show you real quick. Here is just one coat of the brown and when you put a second coat on it lightens up significantly. So go ahead and do two coats of this after it dries just so that it is the lighter color here. And it doesn't matter if you get any of this brown on to any of the other parts of the buildings because um, you're going to be able to cover up any of the paint that inadvertently gets on the walls or the shingles for the roof. So don't stress out about that too much. All right, now I am grabbing some burlap, but whatever light sort of beige color that you want can work. I think in the past I have also used Fawn, which is a little bit uh, darker in terms of the brown, but um, I like burlap a lot, so you can pick whatever light color that you want. And I switch over to just regular sable brushes, and right now I'm using this really um, big one because I have a lot of area to cover, but I might switch um, to touch up the edges with a smaller brush. And what you want to do is you want to keep um, a dark line of the undercoating so you don't have to go all the way up to the edge. And what I found is that this creates a natural border and uh, high, sort of, you know, like your black lining in 2D art. And it just creates a nice little contrast. So see how I'm not going all the way up to the edge of the wood that I painted previously. And then I will have to go back with a smaller brush to get that corner. So I'll go ahead and, and cover one side and you'll notice that it is splotchy. That's because the undercoating again is so dark that it will require another coat. So I just move on to another section and wait for this original first section to dry and then I'll put a second coat on it. So it doesn't matter too much if it's splotchy. And notice that in this model as well as a number of other models that I have seen, there is uh, sections where the plaster has broken off and you have the um, 
material underneath. Sometimes I painted that gray right here, uh, but this time I'm just going to keep it dark brown. Or you can make that um, brick color if you want, but whatever, or a lighter uh, a lighter brown, but whatever the case, you can choose to differentiate the sections where the plaster has fallen off. And then even here, there's some texture that's showing up where there's some cracks and pieces that have fallen off, and, and that's perfectly fine too. It's sort of up to you how much you want to make this um, totally light versus um, keeping all of, I, I always feel like keeping all these little imperfections makes it more realistic. So if you look at these other sides, I've already done them and you can even um, go back and add some more if you want to make it lighter or more consistent, but I still make it somewhat splotchy because uh, especially back then plaster or paint would have been applied inconsistently and I just think it just creates more character that way. So go ahead and do that for all of the sections and then if you inadvertently get some onto the wood don't worry too much about that because we're going to go back with a, another color, a lighter color to highlight that. Now we're going to grab some zinc. This is a dark gray color and I already put it down where there is any stone and there's a lot on the base because of the foundation but also up here in the um, archways for the windows on these pieces and again just using one of these sable brushes I'll go ahead and show you on the roof and I'm being doubly careful not to get any of this gray onto the um, joints where there's where I want to keep it really dark also I'm not putting it on the um, window which I'll go back over and probably do in black and this is the first of two layers of gray and then also here on the chimney all of the stones on the chimney I'm also going to do with this color Again, being careful not to get it into all of the crevices. I'm grabbing some of the slate gray, which is a medium slate gray. See it compared to the zinc. And it's actually a little bit too light to put on directly. So I'm going to mix it up with the zinc a little bit to darken it up. So it's a color in between the two. And then I am going to uh, dry brush um, what I just did with the zinc. Not the whole thing, but just hitting up some of the corners and edges of the blocks. And this just makes the edges stand out a little bit, doing a little bit of dry brushing for the stone. All right, we're gonna have the true blue if you want your roofs to be blue. Alternatively, I have used um, a clay, Georgia clay from the same line of paints to have more of a sort of rusty red roof color, but Wanted to match um, with what was in the pictures on the uh, kickstart page. And this is where you got to be careful because you do not want to get this blue onto all these other sections that you worked so hard to paint up. And I think I'm going to use a smaller brush to get into these crevices so that I don't accidentally color the chimney at all or the uh, wood up here up top. So just get as close as possible. Again I switched over to my hog's hair brush just because 
we're doing a larger surface area and again I want to maintain some of this dark color and as you can see here I'm sort of pulling down on the paint in essence what I want is I want at the bottom of each of these shingles to have more paint and then sort of recess into a darker color up top so that's basically what I'm going for you, you can flip this over if you want it might be a little bit easier to paint that way where you're grabbing the edges with the blue like so and then that way it fades more naturally uh, going up towards the top of the shingle and then typically I do a second coat of this you could lighten it with some gray if you want and highlight again but I think I'm just gonna stick with the blue and as you can see I did the rest of the building here and I think it turned out pretty good here is some folk art this is metallic copper you can choose any other metallic color that you want but I like copper because it's a nice contrast with the blue color if um, I had painted the roof red, more of a clay red color, I probably would do this silver um, just because this copper color would blend in more with the reddish roof. So um, here, again, not super important. In fact, I like to leave some of the undercoating just to have it be a little bit uneven in color. But that's a personal preference of mine. And then I'm going to leave these stacks up here, the dark uh, brown. Now you can definitely go back and hit these up with black. But um, I think the dark brown is dark enough that I'm not going to do that. I think, I think this color is fine without me going in and coloring it black. All right, coming into the home stretch here, we grab some honey brown. This is a lighter brown color. I save this for last because sometimes I um, make a mistake and get some of these other, other colors onto this brown, especially because this is the piece that sticks out the most. So you tend to, if you're gonna get paint on something inadvertently, it's gonna be these uh, sections that are sticking out the furthest. So I'm just putting a very light dry brush just to give the um, brown color a little bit more depth and variation. And as you can see here, you do not want to put this on very thick. In fact, I brush it off, uh, brush off the excess onto uh, a piece of tissue. And that ensures that not too much gets onto here. And you don't have to put this on evenly, but typically I just make sure that it gets on the edges and just highlighting just really subtly, like so. So it just gives a little bit more variation, like, like that. That's what you're aiming for.